Now we move on to general questions and we'll start with question number one, Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to reduce waiting times at the Edinburgh Royal Infirmary. Cabinet Secretary, Shona Robinson. The Scottish Government are actively working to provide support to ensure that significant progress is made to help all boards, including NHS Lothian, to deliver better capacity planning to meet demands and to ensure all patients are seen and treated as quickly as possible. The baseline allocation of NHS Lothian has increased to a total of £1.3 billion in 2017-18. In addition to this increase, the board will also receive an additional £19 million of NRAC parity funding, the largest increase of any NHS board in Scotland. We have also uh, already committed to invest £200 million over the next three years to create a network of five new elective diagnostic and treatment centres across Scotland, including in Edinburgh and Livingston. These centres will enable people to be treated more quickly and will help to meet increasing demand whilst easing the pressures on unplanned and emergency treatment. Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer, but the reality on the ground, as reported in the press, is that doctors at the Royal Infirmary have been being told to send patients home in order to avert a crisis there. Patients are having to wait 17 hours in A&E. Presiding Officer, can you imagine waiting 17 hours with an injury in a waiting room waiting to be seen? So does the Cabinet Secretary agree with Scotland's former lead clinician, Dr Anna Gregor, that under the, uh, the, the SNP, uh, sorry, the NHS in Scotland under the SNP is hurtling over a precipice and has been starved of cash under the SNP? That's, those are direct quotes. And what assurances can she give me and my constituencies that the waiting list crisis at the Royal Infirmary and right across Scotland will end? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, first of all, uh, can I uh, say to Daniel Johnson that the um, NHS, including NHS Lothian, have record levels of resources. However, demand uh, is also increasing, and that's why the reforms that we are putting in place are so important. Daniel Johnson conflated a number of issues in his question, but let me address the one about the A&E uh, waits, which quite rightly uh, were not uh, acceptable. We don't want any long waits in A&E wa in whatever hospital. Uh, the board uh, have offered their assurance that they quickly recovered their A&E performance following what was higher than average attendances in the infirmary on Thursday the 20th of April after the Easter break. Uh, what I can say to Daniel Johnson, which will hopefully reassure him, is that the latest published weekly performance for the Edinburgh Royal Infirmary was 95.4% for the week ending the 16th of April and 93.9% for the week ending the 23rd of April. So hopefully he will accept that the performance in a general sense at the Edinburgh Royal Infirmary on, in the A&E department is actually a very good one. Yes, they did have a surge in demand after the Easter break, but those figures speak for themselves. And I would hope he would support the, uh, the action that the board have taken. He does raise an issue around uh, delayed discharge and making sure that when there is a surge in demand, that it is the responsibility of the whole hospital and their social care partners to ensure that people who are ready for discharge are discharged in a timely manner to make sure that that doesn't lead to unnecessary waits within the A&E department. We would expect everyone within the hospital and the social care partners to get behind and address issues when there is a surge in demand. Very happy to provide Daniel Johnson with more detail if he wants around the action that NHS Lothian is taking to address these matters. Question number two, Alison Harris. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government why its land and buildings transaction tax will generate 800 million less than its original estimate. Finance Secretary Derek McKay. Well, that £800 million figure is deliberately misleading. The latest published data shows that the land and buildings transaction tax revenues across 2015 16 and 2016 17 were close to forecast. The Scottish Government has used the Scotland Reserve to manage volatility in receipts across years, reflecting prudent financial management. The Scottish Government's forecasts were based on the best information available at the time of the forecast and have been endorsed by the Independent Scottish Fiscal Commission as reasonable. When this information changes due to the changes in the economy or changes to the forecast methodology developed in light of feedback from the Scottish Fiscal Commission, then the tax forecast will be revised to reflect this. 
A recent study by Alma Economics, commissioned by the Scottish Government, described the Scottish Government's LBTT modelling as ill-suited for scenario analysis and fiscal impact costing and also poor. So what is the Scottish Government actually doing to ensure its tax modelling is fit for purpose going forward? Well, again, I'm sorry to say that Alison Harris has not fairly characterised the information that we have, and I'm sure as, uh, as uh, prudent as Alison Harris is, she's checked the report as I have done, and it provides analysis of the range of forecasts uh, methodology to, to go through its various determinants, and it actually concluded that our system is good. That was the overall assessment of that particular type um, of methodology. And I would say again that the £800 million uh, figure is totally inaccurate. And I said that our forecasts were very close within range. So the actual figures over both financial years was forecast £919 million, outturn £906 million. So that's a 1% of a difference over both years. Now, I know that Alison Harris is a an accountant will know that it's easier to, to count up what you've already collected, much more difficult to forecast ahead. But I think in anyone's book that that range of forecasting is somewhat impressive. And what's more, there have been, let's face it, turbulence in the economy, including the downturn in oil and gas, and also Brexit impacts as well in terms of that response. So of course forecasts will change. Of course we'll take that into account, uh, including when the, the responsibility for forecasting transfers to the Scottish Fiscal Commission, of course, who can determine their methodology. And that's why this report that was commissioned in light of recommendations will be so helpful. But to further reassure Alison Harris uh, and other members, this government, when it had uh, more devolved taxes uh, than we had uh, projected, we put it in the cash reserve to ensure that it was there in the event uh, of uh, receiving less than had been forecast. So I think all of those actions uh, show that the Scottish Government is managing uh, Scotland's public finances very well. Ashton. What percentage of purchases paid the same or less in LBTT compared to under stamp duty land tax since its introduction? Cabinet Secretary. Oh, I can advise uh, the member and the chamber that for the first two years of LBTT, almost 93% who bought a house for £40,000 or more either paid less tax compared to UK SDLT or no tax whatsoever. Question number three, Mike Rumbles. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the cost of delivering 100% broadband coverage by 2021 and how much it has invested in this programme to date. Cabinet Secretary Fergus Hewitt. Uh, Presiding officer, it's not yet possible to determine the cost of the public sector of delivering our 100% superfast broadband commitment. This will be determined through the procurement process, which will start later this year. A key driver is to maximise investment from suppliers, which will reduce the cost to the public purse. We are currently pre-procurement, so there has been no capital investment in the reaching 100% programme to date. However, we have provision to invest up to £112 million during 2017-18 uh, to improve digital infrastructure across Scotland. This funding will support the final phases of the £400 million Digital Scotland Superfast Broadband Programme, which will deliver 95% fibre broadband coverage across Scotland, enable new activity to begin on delivery of our 100% Superfast Broadband commitment and our mobile infill plans. And this funding is in addition to the £18 million being reinvested through the two DSSB contracts as a result of gain share. Mike Rumbles. <clears throat> well, considering that Ofcom believes that it will cost up to another £250 million to reach everyone with superfast broadband by 2021, by what, date, by what date will Parliament be told how much of the Scottish Government's budget is contributing to this programme? And does he have uh, confidence that uh, his colleague, the Finance Minister, will be forthcoming with all the necessary funds. Fergus Ewing. I have supreme confidence in my colleague. As was evidenced uh, by his forecast of very difficult matter to an accuracy of 1%, quite an outstanding uh, success. Just a shame that others are not are so churlish they can't recognise that. Uh, Ofcom, Mr Rumbles mentioned, recognised that success in Scotland in delivery of broadband has exceeded 
by some measure the performance of our friends uh, down south. When will we deliver it? Uh, we will make progress over the summer and we will proceed with procurement at the end of this year, beginning of next year. And as I informed Mr. Rumbles in a 90 minute session of evidence just this morning, we will keep him fully informed. <laughs> Stuart Stevenson. Uh, given that telecommunications is a reserve matter, can the Cabinet Secretary inform us when he last met UK government ministers to discuss their role in achieving 100% superfast broadband in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I've sought a meeting with uh, the relevant UK minister who is called Matt Hancock, first in a letter in October, then in a letter in January, then in a letter in February, uh, and to date he has not agreed to a meeting. I, uh, so we haven't yet had the, the Hancock's half hour, presiding officer, uh, <laughs> if, that's, if that's what it is to be called. I do think, to be serious, it is disrespectful that a UK minister will not meet with us to discuss serious matters of real importance to Scotland. And it doesn't really suggest that they actually care for Scotland a great deal, does it? Not. Jimmy Green. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Contrary to what the Cabinet Secretary has just said in this chamber, isn't it the case of the £412 million being invested in broadband in Scotland, only 15% of that funding came from the Scottish Government, and in fact, over £100 million came from the UK Government? I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary would instead join me quite cheerily in welcoming this UK government investment in Scotland's digital infrastructure. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I always struggle to be cheerful, despite provocation that we have uh, in, this, in this place. But of course, uh, but of course as a lawyer, I, I would remi remind the member that, in fact, uh, if he reads the Scotland Act, Schedule 5, then he will find, I think at paragraph C5, that it states quite clearly that responsibility for investment in broadband, in internet, in mobile telephony rests entirely with the UK government. Entirely. 100%. And therefore, the fact that he is asking me to be grateful, to be grateful that they are contributing about a quarter of the total does seem to me to suggest that the Tories are not fit to stand up for Scotland. Yeah. Question number four, Mary Fee. To ask the Scottish Government how leaving the EU will impact on third sector funding in West Scotland region. Michael Russell. Presiding officer, EU funding benefits the third sector across Scotland significantly, including in the members region. While we've been assured that funding contracts for structural funds projects that are entered into before the UK leaves the EU will be paid in full, there are no guarantees on European funding streams after the UK leaves the EU. In order to address this uncertainty, the Scottish Government has confirmed that it will be passing on the current UK Government guarantees in full to Scottish stakeholders to provide stability and certainty for key sectors of the Scottish economy. But the Scottish Government will continue to do all it can to protect Scotland's interests in Europe during the UK negotiations to leave the European Union. Mary Fee. Can I thank the Minister for that answer? And despite his um, reassurances, third sector organisations, both across West Scotland and Scotland, continue to be worried about the impact of funding being withdrawn. On leaving the EU, it is clear that new funding streams and mechanisms for delivery will have to be developed. Post Brexit, does the government support a UK-wide cohesion programme or a distinct Scottish system? And do they envisage that this will be subject to the Barnett formula? And will the minister give a commitment to ensure that third sector are closely involved in establishing any new funding programme? Minister. I can not only give that uh, a commitment, I can demonstrate it. I met with the SCVO yesterday for the second time in recent months to discuss uh, issues to do with funding of the third sector. I will be working with them on a, an event in Brussels in June. 
and I have given a commitment to ensure that there is further engagement with them and with others uh, to look at this situation, not just in Scotland, but interestingly, as a member raises, across the UK, because the constant complaint from the third sector is they can get no information from the current UK government, and they can't even get meetings with the current UK government, much as the difficulty that uh, Fergus Ewing has experienced in trying to get those meetings. So I can give a commitment to the member, we will continue to engage with the third sector nationally and locally. We will engage uh, with the third sector outside Scotland to discuss with them how funding should be developed because there are really serious risks, as the member indicates. And we'll also make those representations to the UK government and also in Brussels. Maurice Corrie. Thank you, <coughs> Thank you Presiding Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what proportion of its expenditure from the third sector is now being delivered on a three-year rolling funding structure. Minister. I'm happy to write to the member with that information, but none of it will be delivered on a three-year funding structure if the EU uh, does not, is not involved in funding key third sector projects. So I would commend to Mr Corrie and to other Conservatives that they focus on the issue of ensuring that money continues to flow from the European Union rather than the ideological nonsense which they are presently engaged in. Question number five, Patrick Harvey. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what it considers to be the fairest system for councils to raise local revenue. Yeah, Cabinet Secretary Derek Mackay. We are committed to ensuring fairness in all taxes, and as the First Minister reiterated to the Chamber on April 20th, the Government is willing to discuss across the political spectrum and with council administrations the length and breadth of the country matters relating to local taxation. Patrick Harvey. Well, there was no chance, I'm relieved to say, that the Cabinet Secretary was going to say council tax. After election after election after election, the SNP has stood on a commitment to scrap the unfair, hated council tax. And now that the government is consulting on its Scottish approach to taxation with four key principles, it seems abundantly clear that council tax, as it stands, is not only broken and antique, but also is out of step with the government's own taxation principles. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that the councillors who are elected later this week in councils up and down Scotland should not be consigned to seeing their revenue come from this broken system of taxation, but should have available to them a new modern replacement system of council tax uh, or of local taxation, which will be legislated for during this session of Parliament? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I wish all candidates the very best of luck in the council elections that Patrick Harvey has mentioned, and I look forward to working with local authorities and uh, uh, COSLA leadership as well uh, in these matters, as well as all parties uh, in Parliament in the spirit of the debate that we had on the 22nd of September, where I said that the Parliament supports continued discussion by all parties with local government and wider society of measures to improve progressivity and local financial accountability over the current parliamentary session. What this government has been doing is delivering our manifesto commitments as they relate to taxation from the 2016 manifesto and will continue to do that, but also to engage with other parties and local government to make progress in this area. Thank you, Alfred. That concludes general.